let, let me welcome you uh, all here this evening. I, I'm Bill Mitchell. I'm Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning. Uh, the occasion this evening that, uh, that causes this, uh, this talk to take place is the opening of a new space in the School of Architecture and Planning uh, that includes a magnificent um, recent work by Frank Stella, Luhulu, uh, made uh, available to MIT very generously by uh, Elliot Walk. Uh, we've worked over the weekend to get it all ready to open today, and uh, sure enough, things got finished just in time, and the space uh, duly did open. It's uh, in Building 7. Uh, it's room, I had to check this just before I came up here to talk. It's, it's, it's room 7336, right? Am I correct on this? Yes, yes, I am, I am correct at 7336. We haven't put the number on the door yet, so I have to be careful to, that I give you the right number on this. Uh, it's not open this evening, but as of tomorrow, um, it will be open to the public, and uh, I encourage everybody to come and take uh, a look at this piece. It's a, uh, it's a magnificent piece and a, a great room, and it will also bring you into the heart of the rebuilt headquarters space uh, for the Department of Architecture and the Department of Urban Planning in the uh, school, D Department of Urban Studies and Planning in the School of Architecture and uh, Planning. And uh, it also uh, includes a, a really interesting new exhibition space that we intend to make very active use of. So we welcome you all to that space and, and very much look forward to seeing you all there. Let me make a very brief introduction to what we're going to do this evening. Um, to anyone who's interested in painting or in thinking about painting or in the theorizing of painting, Frank Stella really truly needs no introduction, so I am going to be brief. Um, born in 1936, um, a Boston area native, um, educated at Phillips Andover and at Princeton, for four decades, he's been producing series after series of astonishingly inventive and thought-provoking explorations of what non-figurative painting can be and can become. He's had all sorts of extraordinary twists and turns in the directions that he's taken, confounded and astonished the critics at times, uh, but has been unfailingly thought-provoking and really pushing the envelope, pushing the edges of what painting can be. Um, in the wake of the heyday of abstract expressionism in the 50s, he began to produce, as many of you know, his black painting series. This was followed by the aluminum and copper paintings and the shaped canvases breaking out of the rectangular plane. He moved into painted metal reliefs um, in the 70s. Later, huge three-dimensional pieces in the Moby Dick series and beyond, and explorations that, that's continued until now and has given us Luhulu, the piece that uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to see later on. He's moved back and forth um, from rigorously precise execution to slyful, slyly playful improvisation, from straight lines and flat polygons to the curves with spatial readings of the Exotic Birds series. He's been an innovator in fabrication technique and in, in, in the means of making, of executing paintings, as you'll see uh, later on. In his Norton lectures at Harvard a decade ago, he produced a sustained theoretical exploration of the aims and means of painting that deserves reading and re-reading. We're going to have a conversation about uh, mostly recent work. We're going to sit over here um, on the stage and just talk about the, uh, the, the slides as they come up. I have to tell you, it's completely unrehearsed and ad hoc. Uh, we just looked at the slides a few minutes ago, and we're going to uh, do our best to make this, uh, this interesting for you. But uh, I think it will be. Just before we start, uh, what I'd like to do to give you uh, an idea of what we've been going through in, in uh, pulling this uh, extraordinary piece of work um, into the MIT context. We're going to show you a video of the uh, work arriving at MIT, and in particular, some extraordinarily skillful crane operators uh, maneuvering it in through the window of Building 9. Now, I saw some of this happening. I haven't seen the video, so, uh, so let's take a look and uh, see what happened as this, uh, this piece joined MIT.
Is that on? Yeah, yeah we're on. Okay. I'm going to, uh, I can't resist a blackboard, so I'm going to draw. I mean, I'm not going to draw, actually. I'm going to write a few words on the blackboard, and then we can uh, start showing the slides and, uh, and go on from there. Uh, you know, there are basically two questions that I get asked over and over and over again. You know, one, why did you change? And two, what's, what's going on today? Uh, why I changed, I don't, really don't have an answer to that, except, you know, it's obvious. I mean, it, you, you just, you keep going. But uh, what's going on today, uh, which is a way of talking about what we just saw in the video clip, I'd just like to run by you as, as simply as I can, uh, you know, the way I see what's happening, say, now. You know, the, you know what's the, I, I'm not going to define what the art of the 90s is, but it's interesting to see, or at least to talk about, what, what's happening and what not just I'm thinking about, but really what everybody else is thinking about. And it's uh, pretty easy to, to explain it or to make a very simplified version of it. And so it, it really consists of two things. Um, and uh, so what you have today is uh, you have a, a painting, all right? So if you have painting, I, I know you all know that that's painting. <laughs> but, uh, but it doesn't have to be just painting. It's really art, too, today. So because you're making art, and most of it's going to be, it can be painting, it can be other things. But it breaks down into two things, which is we have literalism. It's a horrible word, but it's the best one. And we have illusionism. OK? And we used to have problems like abstraction and representationalism. But that doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, we have 100 years of that. And it break, it, it's come now in the 90s or at the end of the century to this kind of way of seeing things. So they don't necessarily have to conflict. But they, they represent two different poles, or they represent maybe two different ideas. But they all revolve around the same thing, uh, which is that in order to do anything you have to have, you have to deal with boundaries. OK? I don't know why I like spelling these. I just like writing with a chart to see if I can spell. You have boundaries and you have surface. OK, and that's what you're going to see a lot of and uh, in the slides, and those are the kinds of things that I'm going to talk about a lot. Uh, in what you saw in the video, uh, you can already see how much it's about surface and how much it's about boundaries. And you can see that if it were just what it is, uh, when you see the back side of the piece, that would be the literal part. I mean, that might be good enough. It might be a Henry Moore. It might be a, might be a minimalist structure. It could be in steel and be a Richard Serra and do quite well. But it has something else, which is the painting, which is the surface that I worked on anyway. It's, uh, it's involved with illusion uh, or illusionism. And that's what brings it back towards painting. And the literalism doesn't exclude painting. But it's that sometimes it, uh, it's a conflict. And so we'll go basically from there, looking at the slides, see how uh, I got to it and what other things it leads to. Basically. It, what the conclusion is going to be, uh, or what you might come to as a conclusion yourself when we get through looking at the slides, is that art, in the end, will pass through all of these things, through literalism, illusionism, boundaries, and surface, basically. And it'll end up by defining art as something that you already knew what it was there, which is it's going to be painting, sculpture, and architecture. So it won't be a surprise to you. But, uh, but that's what the fine arts are. And what happens is a lot of the divisions and different ways that we have of looking at things have to do with the kind of, not necessarily confounding, but they have to do with people taking positions uh, in relation to these things uh, in which they want to have their own thing or find that the thing that they do best being the better thing. But we're not going to really worry about that. We're just going to see how they can uh, come together. And we don't know how they're going to. Uh, I certainly don't know how it's going to happen, but you can see in the work that I'm doing that they do relate to each other and they do become involved. I'm not saying that a synthesis is a great idea, but you can see, at least, or I can see, that there are some possibilities for a kind of synthesis that would be interesting. Uh, and that's why I change. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, let's have some slides and we can take down the light. A lot of people, the piece on the left, I made at Andover in, uh, in 1953 or 54. And um, it's the Brooklyn Bridge, believe it or not. And a lot of people think that I painted the Brooklyn Bridge, but that was Joseph Steller and we're not related. So actually it's a kind of opportunity to, uh, to sort of lay that one to rest. When I first came to New York, a lot of people said that they were quite surprised to see what a young man I was. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't that surprised. I was young. I mean. <laughs> and the picture on the left is a, a painting um, which is very typical for the time. Uh, it's a kind of uh, abstract expressionist painting. I mean, it, it seems to me, actually, although it might be predate Al Leslie's, some of his paintings a little bit that way, but very much like Motherwell, Al Leslie, pretty much uh, kind of uh, second or, you know, abstract expressionist painting. Uh, but, you know, the people that I was most influenced probably in this painting were Motherwell and, and, and Gottlieb. And it was called, interestingly enough, it had a title. And um, the title came out of a New York Post uh, uh, headline, but anyway, that painting was called Requiem for Johnny Stampanato, and I'm sure that no one here really remembers who Johnny Stampanato was, but he was a hood who came to an unfortunate end <laughs> with Lana Turta's adopted daughter when she stabbed him in the kitchen. Okay, we can go on. Uh, yeah, that was the last kind of painting on the left that I made before I made the black paintings. So you can see the transition from the painting of uh, the Johnny Stampanato painting. And, and really, it's a landscape. And the real change is pretty straightforward and pretty simple. It's, it, it, it happened by painting out. You can see that there was a structure underneath and that there was a painting that was formed with bands and blocks. And you can see that somewhere there, a frustration uh, occurred and things were, and then it got painted out. But it got painted out in such a way that it became a whole painting. And that idea of painting it all yellow or painting over the other painting and making the bands carry the whole thing is what made the black paintings possible because then they were all black. It seemed to be okay. It seemed to be a way for painting. And again, I don't want to, you know, tie in too much with, uh, but, you know, if you were to see the Mondrian show now, I mean, one of the things about the abstraction and that kind of painting is how landscape derived it is. And, and this is only a coincidence to me, but both of the paintings that you saw although the Brooklyn Bridge happens to be the bridge, it's a landscape kind of painting, and the uh, painting for Johnny Stampanato is a, basically a landscape painting, and this is a landscape painting. This is called Astoria, and it was about uh, the sunrise uh, in the morning as you travel on the, on the subway to Astoria. Okay. Um, the one on the left, believe it or not, although it looks like an abstract painting, is actually a portrait. It's a portrait of Carl Andre. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, these were all, I, I did a series of paintings which were um, polygons with the uh, centers dropped out and that could be a frame and the portrait obviously could go in the middle. But I left, I knew what Carl looked like so I left it out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I did a series of other people. I did uh, Leo Castelli and Ileana, his wife, and, and all my friends. It was a, a, a group of portraits. But actually, it was an interesting thing because I did an octagon. Right after that, the graphics in, uh, started to form images uh, which had uh, spaces in the middle. And uh, the one I can think of is the Chase Manhattan Bank logo, which uh, appeared about uh, six weeks after my show at Leo's announcement. And then uh, that was a painting the, later on, which is, uh, again, and you can see boundaries become an issue here in surface. That's practically the only issue, but I mean, it, uh, it's an interesting way to see it. And this, uh, this in a way, relates something, uh, finding a way to deal with the things that, that come up later, or a way of looking to make a space. OK, we can go on. Sorry. Well. This gets into a, another idea, which is a, a way of dealing with the boundaries and the surfaces. But this time, the, the thing that's going to be painted, or the painting, instead of being kind of self-defining, becomes something that's built. And then the painting uh, takes place on what's built. So it's a way of uh, thinking about the painting 
as not so much marks on a surface, but as a, as a structure, as sort of building what it is that you want and then painting it so that there's, uh, uh, but in order for it to work, the, the problem with this kind of way of working and thinking about things is that it's not so easy uh, to make the painting uh, seem that it really, it, it has to do something more than appear to be on the surface. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's, just, it's just difficult, that's all, but it's a problem. But I mean, it also has its kind of rewards because it's a way to be, uh, you know, at least pictorially and graphically dramatic uh, in a relatively easy way. These are fabricated in metal? Yeah, that, that's uh, fabricated in uh, aluminum, and the other has uh, fiberglass. And that's honeycomb aluminum. And the other thing here is, is treating the surface, which is, uh, it doesn't show up much there because it was very shallow, but it was, uh, the surface was, uh, the aluminum was etched first, and then the painting, and then ink and some things were scrubbed on the surface to give it a, a kind of movement. You get, get them fabricated in a shop and then bring them back. Yeah, this was the, the beginning of the surfboard technology, actually, which uh, ends with uh, Lumalu, uh, which is this was uh, fabricated in, in California. And this is a, taking what we've just seen before one step uh, farther, uh, further, I guess. And um, it, uh, again, it's a, uh, but there are new elements, uh, and there's an attempt here uh, to make the surfaces move. So uh, it, they're not just planar surfaces in relation to each other, tilt, uh, tipped or tilted. It's a, a you know, it's a, in, you know, introduction of a, a, another degree and level of complexity. Now I didn't do these. But <laughs> <laughs> But this interests me a lot, uh, and the reasons are down there. Uh, literalism, illusionism, boundaries, and surface, and even painting and art. Uh, you know, the surface here is given. Uh, on the other hand, it's used, and it's a, a very complicated, very irregular surface. And uh, on the face of it, you know, we would assume that they didn't really care that much about the surface. But uh, let's have the next slide. It's pretty obvious on the one on the right, you know, when they go to the trouble of incising and uh, uh, cutting the line in it, there's a, a tremendous feel for the surface and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the given things. There's, there's making your and controlling your own surface by indenting and making the relief. And then there's the use of the relief and the protrusions that are given by nature and the surface. So it, it only goes to show that, uh, that from the very beginning, you know, people who know what they're doing or care about what they're doing have a sensitivity to the whole scene, the whole situation, and the touch uh, really, uh, and uh, you have to bring your own touch to the surface, but you know, you need a surface to react to in a way too. It, it, uh, you know, it always helps. I mean, I think there's a, been a big, it's not a big problem, but you can see that the assumption of being given a neutral or flat surface to work on is not such a great gift. Uh, um, as you can see from these paintings. Now, this is something that we don't have anymore, and uh, we don't have these kind of complicated architectural surfaces to work on. Again, this is a given surface, uh, but it's man-made, uh, much like the surface in the caves in uh, Lascaux and Altamira. And again, it's the question of, you know, or the issue or the interest in, in surfaces and things that you can do when you're given an opportunity. Uh, you know, I mean, things happen when there are opportunities, when there are challenges. And, and these are uh, the Roman and the German uh, are, are good examples. Uh, and they also serve as, as, as pretty good reminders that uh, uh, you know, the degree of complexity can be quite great, and uh, problems in dealing with them are, are great too. Uh, by and large, in this case, most of the solutions are what we would call scenographic, and we would tend to say, well, it's decorative. And those things are all true, but when there, you know, there are also other examples where the, the, these things are taken to heights expressive and, uh, and uh, heights that uh, are, are truly great, and it couldn't be done any other way. 
hear the surface dissolves too. If you're down on the floor, you don't mm -hmm. know where the, where the true surface is. Yeah, but I mean, it's hard to find a place to look at things. Yeah. It's hard to know where you are. I mean, it's also hard to know who you are. But, the, <laughs> but now, uh, having shown the things that we saw running through the paintings and the ideas, some of the ideas, just skipping over the top, what happens is, I mean, again, we talk about change, which is that uh, at some point, uh, you take things from the outside and you deal with them in a kind of ordered way or you make a, a mark or a drawing, you try to order things, you try to organize them. And then at some point, uh, you, it's, it's hard not to be interested in the things that happen that are beyond your control and beyond your actually imaginative ability or um, you know, just any ability. I mean, for me, this is beyond my ability to comprehend it. But anyway, these were actually done uh, re uh, relatively recently, about four or five years ago. But I started on it when I was working on, uh, uh, actually, when I was in Elliott House at Harvard. And uh, uh, I was blowing smoke rings. And uh, Harriet had gone back to the city, and I was there alone. And uh, they heated up the room, as they do in all universities. And then they think that's warm enough. They turn off the heat. and. Uh, uh, and this was a, a, a happy moment when the heat was off and the air was very still and it was still warm enough. Blowing the smoke rings, uh, they started to do a lot of things and they filled up. And I really could see the smoke just because I was alone in the room with just one light where I was reading and blowing the smoke out. And uh, the way they hovered, uh, they held and then they did what they did here, which they dropped and they sort of bifurcate. They make other smoke rings. And as you can see, these are photographs. Uh, actually, the fellow that you saw in there, Andrew Dunn, who kept saying shit all the time when he was putting things, was the one who photographed these, too. Uh, this was, but this was almost as unpleasant as putting the piece in the room uh, because the black box uh, was pretty hard to handle. But anyway, we photographed these from uh, six sides in a black box. And then uh, with, the, with the photograph from each side, we had a cube. And then with that, we could trace them and then feed it into the computer and get go on. I think we'll see some, get a, a version. Oh, this is another. No, this is a continuation of the, There's uh, someone else blowing a smoke ring. <laughs> uh, but actually, he wasn't smoking. And uh, that's a, uh, we're making a piece of sculpture there. And I only throw that in to show you that um, it's the interest in things uh, outside that, that you really can't control. Uh, molten metal is pretty, that's molten stainless steel. <laughs> And you can use it, but you can't really control it, or at least we haven't found a way to control it. And uh, uh, again, the smoke is the same thing. It, it sort of dissipates itself, so it's pretty hard to, to get it to do exactly what you want. And so I guess that the, the interest or the change has been in things that have their own way of doing things that you can be involved with, you can participate, you can look at it, you can see them, you can try to work with them, you can try to shape with them, but it's to see if some of those things won't give you a way to sort of spring out, to get beyond where you were. What, what kind of smoke is it? Cigar smoke? Well, I don't, uh, yeah, my smoke is cigar smoke. I think that, <laughs> that's not smoke. I smoke rings anyway. Yeah. That was cigar smoke. No, that's the, the that's the porpoise making. I mean, uh, the, the beluga, that's a beluga whale. But the whale, he, he yeah, 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 yeah. No, the ones before were smoke, yeah. But and also it was his form that uh, led to the uh, shapes in the in the paintings before, which is the beluga moving. Okay. I guess we can go on. Okay, that's the that's the net. That's the computer's version of what we saw in the smoke. Not exactly those rings, but that's. Uh, uh, that's one way we could get it. And then you all know this. I mean, you're sure you're very familiar. That's just on the computer, but that's a net, an open net, and the other is a solid version of it, what it would be like if it were a perfume bottle. Now, that's a painting on the right, quite similar, that has the forms in, uh, and there are two basic forms in here. That there's the smoke ring. Uh, most of those drawings are uh, versions of the computer uh, drawings of the smoke rings. And there are basically two kinds. There's a, there's a net, and then there are, there are some two-dimensional outlines, just uh, uh, drawings. And then, then there are some of the three-dimensional ones with those complicated ones with all the numbers, which you all know are, are sliced versions of the solid. Uh, and then you tip them so they make kind of dramatic drawings. And 
the other thing are the dots. So it was a combination of the smoke drawing and uh, dot, the, the colored uh, images in the background. And those are enlargements of uh, four color printing dots, actually. And uh, on the left is uh, some very unsuccessful, but sort of uh, what I'm looking for, or one of the things we were looking at, I don't know how far we'll get, um, it was a question of making the dots three-dimensional and, of course, making the smoke rings three-dimensional. And those dots are, uh, uh, are three-dimensional dots, but they're, they're derived from lumps of clay, and they're scanned and then put in the computer. It's kind of complicated and expensive, but it was the only way we could get chunks that were of, of what we wanted. So that's how the, the chunks, or how the dots, if they became three-dimensional, would relate to the smoke rings when they became three-dimensional. So that's a whole other problem that's either ahead of us or maybe become forgotten. I don't know. But that's another possibility uh, compared to the way we're doing it, which is in a, a relatively conventional and uh, flat way. Basically, the painting represents the drawings on paper, printed on paper and cut out. They're basically, these paintings, uh, including the one that's upstairs, are basically paintings that have some illusion in them, but it's the illusion of a collage of cut pieces of paper that are then enlarged. Uh, so that's the piece that's upstairs when it was in the Nodler Gallery on the right. And then these are flat pieces. This is in the Kawamura, Kawamura Museum uh, in Japan. And that's when we were uh, conceiving of the pieces as uh, you know, kind of installed murals to, to uh, relate to the actual space that was there. And this is what it, uh, as they say, turns out to be. Uh, on the one hand is a painting by a graffiti artist, and the other hand is a painting of mine. And they're not, you know, in the end, they're not that different. But I mean, you can, it's a way of making the thing sort of move or, you know, the issue here for me anyway, I'm not sure what the issue was for him, but it was to make it, make it move out. And one of the problems with the graffiti, not that I think that that's either a good or a bad painting, it, I, I don't think it's either one, but it can be very good. But one of the problems with it is that, it, and it's the same thing that happens with me, which is that you're forced to make it on a canvas. Uh, so it has a boundary and it has, it's a convention. So it's forced to become a painting. The painting on the graffiti was put in a gallery and the, and the guy, and the, this kid who's perfectly capable of handling a spray can uh, with a lot of effect, it would be better on, the, on metal or on the side of a moving subway car than it is on canvas. Uh, when it stops moving, when it's static, and there's a problem, the same problem uh, I have, uh, because it, it, it's, just on a, it's just on a canvas. I mean, I make it move as much as I can. I do all kinds of things. But in a way, you know, I'm not that satisfied with it, although I like it optically. I mean, I like it as illusion. But again, I mean, I'm still torn. Uh, I'd like it to be literal, too. Uh, and this was the beginning of the idea on a public scale. This is the back, uh, this is just a painting outside on the back of a theater in Toronto, the Princess of Wales Theater. And then we'll see the inside now. This was the start uh, for one reason or another. And it's the painting on the, that's I think a quarter Taurus. I'm pretty sure that's what it is anyway. Can see it? And, uh, but the thing about it is that it works. And it works when, I, when we looked at the uh, paintings before, the graffiti painting and my painting. Uh, they had the conventional boundaries. There's something about the imagery, uh, the smoke rings. Uh, I mean, I guess it's a little bit obvious. But anyway, the fact that the circular shape and the moving around, does the boundaries, which are the top and the bottom of that, don't seem to press themselves on you in the way that uh, they normally would. The fact that, there's no, that there are no side edges, that the imagery keeps moving and keeps circulating, uh, I think is a, is a tremendous plus. Uh, that's some detail. And, and then this is, uh, these are the balcony fronts. And uh, what's interesting about those, I think, in some ways, is that they're totally abstract. There's some of the computer imagery. There's some of the forms that actually you'll see later in some of the other things. We used everything that we used, and we just made it in relief and then cast it. 
And the result was it looked very ordinary, actually, very unabstract and very much like a floral decorative design, maybe from the 18th century. But the big plus was of it, it was it was acoustically very successful. It's in uh, Toronto in a theater called the Princess of Wales Theater, which was a new theater uh, built actually to, for Miss Saigon. And now Beauty and the Beast is there. <laughs> <laughs> Cast like aluminum? Or? Yeah, this is cast aluminum, the same idea like the other things were cast plaster. And then this is a part of the theater downstairs in a, uh, I don't know, some kind of, not a restaurant, but I don't know what it is, a bar. And that's, uh, I mean, you can see that the architecture is not exactly flattering, but you can still carry it. And one of the advantages of this kind of imagery and uh, this way of dealing with things is you can sort of fight your way through almost anything. Uh, these are big murals in the lobby, and they look nice in the, in the photographs, actually, in the slides. They're not so red hot when you see them. They're painted, they're painted with uh, uh, the most modern billboard technology available. It's a transparency that's red, uh, scanned, and then it's uh, sprayed with uh, four colored dots on plastic, but it's super durable, and it's, uh, uh, and it's uh, you know, the machine can paint that mural in about, uh, I don't know, 80 or 90 hours. It just keeps, it goes night and day, and then it's done in a couple of days. Well, for those of you who are architects, I'm sure you'll love these. Um, <laughs> these are the drawings uh, um, that we made uh, after we built the piece that's upstairs. And we made these drawings uh, for a gallery exhibition, which actually is going to open next week in New York. And uh, the reason that we did it is that we wanted to try out the idea, and we wanted to do what we couldn't do upstairs, which is to paint on both sides of the surface. So these are freestanding uh, sort of murals, and they'll be painted on both sides. And because uh, we designed it right into the computer, uh, we're able to have it uh, carved uh, directly. So the, the technology, the fittings and everything, it's much smoother and much nicer uh, than the piece that's upstairs, although I'm not trying to denigrate that in any way. But we've made a technological advance since that uh, piece was done. What, what's the material? It's, uh, it's uh, fiberglass. It's, just, fiberglass. It's, like, it's really a big surfboard. Uh -huh. okay. and, and then I mean, it's the wave and the surfboard, I guess it's the whole thing. But it's just really, literally a big surfboard. And, it, and it's cut into sections and they fit and it's... Uh, it's pretty smooth. Well, there are a couple of uh, pictures of it later on. Is it, is it, what, what kind of milling machine? Three axis, five axis? You know? I don't know. I'm not. It just works. I'll have to. Okay. I'll check. <laughs> and it's pretty. It's pretty sophisticated. Yeah. I, mean, but I don't know if it has. I mean, it's. Yeah, we can go through these. I mean, maybe some people like these, but and anyway, that's what we did. Okay, next. But again, you know, they stand up. So, I mean, it's pretty simple. It's a rectangle on the bottom and a wavy line drawn on the top, and then you connect the surfaces like a minimal surface. And that's what it looks like when it's being done. That's the studio, and that's those paint, those, that's those things, and uh, you can see that it looks like a surfboard there in the corner. It's pretty good. It's pretty smooth, and uh, uh, it's pretty easy to work on. Okay, a few more shots. It's mostly masking. But you can see how to paint while you're talking on the telephone. As I say. <laughs> you learn a lot from looking at these things. And uh, this is the last idea. This is, um, this is what you take an idea and you give it to an engineer. The idea is pretty simple. It was uh, um, a beach hat that uh, my kids got for me in Rio. And it's a piece of foam. And uh, uh, there are spirals cut out of the center. They're just cuts. So it's really cuts in a two-dimensional plane. But it's a beautiful form for twisting. Uh, once you cut it. I mean, almost anything you do with it looks great. Uh, so let's see what we did with it. Yeah. 
that's the same form. And uh, these, this is being built now in Antibes. Uh, we tried to build it in America, but it was too expensive, and they didn't want to do it. But we found some boat builders in Antibes, and we found a naval architect uh, uh, to help us uh, with it. And uh, what's interesting about it is that um, it's exactly the same uh, from a technical point of view. It's exactly the same as the model. Uh, the model is a small piece of plastic Sintro that's cut out, and that's bent and twisted. And so we convinced these guys to just work for us for a few months, and they laid out uh, fiberglass on the floor, and they made the sheet. So the sheet was made uh, with a diameter of about 24 feet. And then the cuts were made, and then they bent that, and then they laminated uh, um, balsa wood to that, and then laminated the other surface, and then took the cut. So they, they literally made it the hard way. Uh, but it's actually the only way that you can get the forms that, uh, that I know of anyway that, uh, that are this complicated and within some kind of reasonable uh, kind of expense. The reason we had to go to this uh, trouble was that uh, um, it's, it has to be suspended, and it's in a place that's uh, aluminum and glass and, and can't take much of a load, so we had to be under 6,000 pounds. It's uh, roughly 24-foot 20, diameter. And this is the same form seen in uh, two different computer renditions of the same idea used uh, to make a building rather than just a sculpture. And I think that might be it. I don't know if there's any more stuff. Yeah, that's the end of the slide. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can uh, put the lights on. And I, yeah, I, I, I suspect various people may have questions they'd like to raise. OK. okay. Well, the subway car is pretty straightforward. It just moves, you know, by you, and depending on the speed. But it's just, it's not so important uh, what the, actually the movement is. It could move, you know, sideways, could go this way, up and down, and back and forth. But it's the sense of movement. I mean, most paintings that are successful, or most paintings that you care about, uh, have a sense of movement. Now, by definition, Painting has a serious, and it's one of the things that comes up nowadays uh, with literalism and is you know painting is static; it doesn't move, and uh, almost anybody can make a painting that moves or make an object that moves. And uh, you know one of the reasons why film is so popular, it can make a claim to being you know more advanced or better than painting because it moves, it flickers, and it and it's better at depicting movement. You know, these things are all relative, but they're important. And I think that, uh, uh, you know, the success of painting in the past, which is why I bring up the uh, notion or the, the problem of illusionism, has been its success at being uh, a static art that implies uh, movement in a convincing way. Uh, you know, I don't want to play with words, I mean, but the, the literal movement uh, within the picture, the action, whatever is depicted that takes place, and, you know, the emotional substance of it. I mean, you are moved in a way, too, but I think that they have to come together. Uh, that's really what, you know, when we say a painting is great, that's really what we're talking about. It seems vital to us, and there's a kind of movement in, a, in an unreal situation. After all, it's static, and at the same time, we are moved, uh, the interior, our interior, our consciousness, our feelings and everything are moved. So there's these two kinds of movement, neither of which are quantifiable in any way. I mean, you can't really very well describe, or it doesn't mean much to say, I feel this or I feel that, because how do you know what the other person knows? He doesn't really know very much about what you feel or what it means to you feel. You can say, you know, I feel sad, uh, but you know, th these are not very exacting. And uh, it's the same way about the sense of how successful the movement is within the picture. So you have, but these things still, nonetheless, as difficult as they are to deal with, it seems to me anyway pretty clear that they are what, uh, what painting both is and is about. 
Well, that was a short answer, sorry. <laughs> And also, I know there's a new biography coming out on you by Huberman. And, and well, he won't know the answer, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I can guarantee that. However, there's a person sitting four rows back here who's uh, our expert on Melville. But the title comes from a Melville novel, which I haven't read. Uh, <laughs> and I make no apologies. Uh, um, in fact, when we went to a Melville symposium, uh, you know, we all live in our own little worlds, as they say. But a woman came up to me and was so happy that I had done, uh, she expected me to do for uh, Melville, for Marty, uh, for what I'd done for Moby Dick. I mean, I just spent five years working on Moby Dick, and she wanted me to spend another five or six years working on Marty to see if I could resurrect it, because she felt it was a very underappreciated effort. But that wasn't my goal, and it's not going to be my goal. An error of uh, cooperation between artists and architects, similar to what went on in the past? Well, I, I don't think so. <laughs> My experience with architects has been pretty grim, but, um, <laughs> but um, I, I think, yes, I mean, I think, it, I think it's possible. I mean, you know, basically you get the job after the architect has done what he's done. And so if I want to work with an architect, I mean, I'll hire him. I mean, but I want to, I mean, I mean, I can make the building. You could, you could cooperate. I mean, but the problems are, it's not, nothing is very conducive to it. I mean, the whole scheme for building uh, is, you know, so obvious and so complicated at the same time that they're really, I mean, the, the main problem is, is not just for the architects and the artists working together. It's really a problem for the architects too. Few, if any, architects that I know of in, in recent time if Frank Gehry tries it once in a while, are able to change anything. Uh, in other words, you know, you're committed to a building scheme after the plan is in. That's it. It's over. I mean, you can see what mistakes you made, but you can't do anything about it. You know, and nothing changes. I mean, Gaudi is the last one I can think of. Uh, Nervi was pretty good at it, but Gaudi, Nervi, th those people could make things happen and make things change. Corbusier did it in some of the houses. I mean, you know, but I mean, you know, architects are no different from anybody else. I mean, they don't get it all right the first time. I mean, as we well know. There seems to be more interest amongst artists uh, dealing with uh, murals or site-specific works than the other way. Architects interested in having artists work in the, uh, after they finish their designs. Well, I I don't know. There probably is. Uh, it's probably true that way. I mean, I mean, you know, but it's a small world. I mean, uh, and there's a lot of building. And there are a few architects who, you know, have a sense of themselves and what they can do and what art's about that, that can, you know, maybe only a few arch architects can really afford to bring people in to do the jobs. I mean, uh, you know, there isn't much left in the budget. Most of the work that gets done, as you well know, is, is uh, from the few jobs that are mandated. Uh, you know, uh, the budget mandates uh, some decoration or art. And I've yet to meet a, an architect who didn't complain about that, too. I'm going to ask you to explore that a bit more. Also, the issue of scale. The beach towel that looks good at the scale of a couple of feet and then becomes a sculpted form at tens of feet and then becomes a building at 200 feet scale. Uh, going from that painting to a sculpted form of architecture, uh, it seems to me that sometimes the form becomes pretty intimidating when it becomes a building, when it becomes architecture. It's yeah, well, look, I mean, I made a building for the project, I didn't have it here, for Dresden, and Philip Johnson built it in his, as his gatehouse in New Canaan, and it was a monstrous masterpiece. I mean, but it, it was only the shell of what we did. We never worked on the fenestration or the roof or anything like that, but the form, uh, he was able to build it and blow it up. It seemed to work okay. I'd like to raise the question about the painting being static, because I recall, for example, with the question in the uh, panorama, that it would rotate the stage, you know, as it developed to the various forms, the panorama. In Mississippi, in Missouri, yeah. Well, the painting, yeah, it was a, the painting didn't move. I mean, the painting, yeah, moved as you, you rolled up one end and unrolled the other, and you moved it across. Yeah. The audience rotated in a sense, and of course, if you went to a gallery, you're moving, and so the painting is relatively distant, right? 
you're getting movement. So, you know. Okay, but it's still, I mean, I don't know. There are a lot of ways of looking at it, but I mean, the basic thing is you make a mark, you act, and you make a mark, and that's it. It, it stays there. It doesn't move after you, you know, you can't keep the paint moving after it dries. Or, you know, I mean, that, that's it. I mean, you could. I mean, you could make it slippery. There, there are a lot of things you could do, but it's not, it would be both complicated and difficult. And uh, uh, although you see a lot of that in uh, uh, installations and stuff, uh, I remember uh, Bob Rauschenberg did a piece for Art and Technology, which was a big steel box with um, mud and uh, hot water in it and the bubbling mud. <laughs> it wasn't bad. <laughs> and it was certainly a good, as an idea, it sounds better than it looked. I mean, you get tired of the bubble. <laughs> but you know, I mean, you can say that paintings get tired. I mean, but I'm just, it just raises the issue. I mean, it's a good way of seeing it. I mean, it's that the, the point about painting is, and, the, and but painting also has a past and has a history. I mean, it has, I don't know if it's the convention that we accept and that we like, or they really did it right. You know, sometimes it happens in the right way, and it's convincing, and it's okay. And then when you bring up the issue, like having the boiling mud, it's sort of interesting to bring up the issue, and it, it, it gets your attention. And then, but, you know, does it carry? Does it hold as much as the, uh, you know, non-bubbling works in the past? Um, I noticed in working space, you're very interested in Caravaggio, I believe. And now we see these frescoes in palaces and churches and things like this. And the, um, the theater in Toronto, where you're into the building decoration, do you find that you end up wishing that things looked more like they did in the 1600s, say, instead of the clean, modernist look of, say, 10 to 50? Ten, what's 10 to 50? This. Oh, this room? Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what, 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 what was the point, or what does Caravaggio have to do? Yeah, I mean, I think it's basically, I mean, I have, the reasons for Caravaggio are different from the general reason, which is the Baroque. I mean, which is, uh, the reason I was drawn to it or interested in it uh, was uh, a matter of change. I mean, uh, you know, for the, in my working life, as it were, you know, for 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, making things, quote, literal, direct, and simple seemed to have a tremendous virtue. And, uh, you know, I just it didn't, I didn't find it convincing, and it's nice to look to some. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't just what everybody said. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't all that great. And it wasn't, but I don't think that's as important as it wasn't going anywhere. And I'm not saying that this way of working or anything is necessarily going anywhere. It, it is different, and to me anyway, the, the painting in itself and the way it relates to both the architecture and the sculpture seems to me anyway a pretty fruitful way of working. And you know, if I look at what I've done uh, and what I'm doing, I, I have to say, well, it may not be that great, but it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not boring me to death. Two questions. One has to do with the transformation from the gray values to the color. If the smoke was a gray value, you can transfer it to color. And I was wondering how you did that. And two, I was wondering how the smoke was um, actually they moved vertically and. Yeah, well, that, I, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying, but one of the things is true. One of the senses that you, you that you, there's no way of getting, which is really beautiful about the smoke, is that first of all, it goes in the direction that you send it, but then when it hovers, when it stops, it then creates its own sense of dropping out. And as it drops, it forms, uh, you know, again, depending on all kinds of things like the temperature and the currents and air currents and everything. And that has its own kind of, you know, really compelling uh, dynamism, which, which I like. Uh, I'm not going to get that in the painting. I'm not worried about that. Um, but uh, the idea is that maybe in some way, which is not, you know, not that clear, as I mean, uh, one way or the other, I get something like that. That's what I'm going to settle for. I'll be quite happy if I get a little closer. Could you describe your um, methods of working with assistants? What, what do you do? What do they do? And how do you feel about it? Well, I can tell you what they feel. They feel they do everything. <laughs> and I, 
and I, I on the phone. right, 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 and I, yeah, and I make a mess of all their really good ideas, but um, you know you have to learn to live with it. Uh, we, um, they all are tremendously talented. They do a really good job, and they do things I can't do. Uh, and they have a lot of good ideas, but I like some of my ideas too. You know, it's, you, you just work it out. You just keep banging away. It's uh, uh, the biggest thing, that, the only reason that they stay is because of the opportunities. I mean, because we do work on new ideas, there are things to do, and they can get to run off by themselves and do what they want to do that they couldn't do otherwise. But if it weren't for that, they would be long gone, I guarantee you. Uh, I'm curious about these sculptural forms that you're working with now, the last few slides that you showed, and uh, they seem very compelling forms, and in the slides, they weren't yet painted. One of them was turned into architecture, but I'm thinking more Yeah, no, the, the one that was painted was the way it's supposed to be, as far as I'm concerned. The client would like it to be more colorful. His decorator, his color consultant told him that it should be gold with pastel tints. But, <laughs> But, but um, we made it white with uh, color on the edges. And Kevin Roach said, he made me swear on the Bible that I, it could only be white. I couldn't ruin the space and everything. It just can't have color in there. It just has to be pure white. I said, fine, I want it to be white. So then, tech, the, the, so then the client comes and he says, you know, Kevin says it really should be very colorful there. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, it's a compromise. It has color on the edges and white on you know 80 percent of it but the form that piece i mean should be white i mean and and the, the, i don't i don't know i mean i could work on it more and i probably will the color on the edges is not is not the wrong idea it, it's just a, it's not that easy to get it right and get it to singapore in 20 days <laughs> but you know you've made the form and then you've made paint right but this that form is uh you know, it could be in a painting or it could be a relief or something like that. But right now, that, that form seems to be pretty straightforward. It's a, it's a sculptural form and it works. I think it's tremendous. And I think it has, I think it'll work as, a, as an architectural form too. I mean, I know it will. I mean, uh, it's just a question of the expense. Uh, building it architecturally is, is difficult. And, but the real problem is not that. The forms could be built. I mean, if it were, uh, you know, for a band shell in Rio de Janeiro, you could build it in 10 minutes. But uh, if you're going to put it in, uh, you know, in Bangor, Maine, you've got you to gotta seal it. It's got to be weather, t weather tight is a pretty severe test for those kind of forms. Any questions about your values in your little diagram on the blackboard? It seems to me, especially in the, in the Lula piece, that boundaries are, in fact, part of the illusion in the room, that you have the, the actual physical boundaries of the, the mm -hmm. room, the four sides, the walls and that the, the painting then actually starts to create this illusion of where the boundaries are. So is, in fact, boundaries just as much a part of the illusion as the surfaces and not part of the I'm illusion? I'm with you 100% or 150%. Uh, that, I think, is the point that I most wanted to make, is that they, uh, you know, it's, a, it, they're, it's the relation of the things to each other and their ability to expand and to uh, form, you know, in a way, something else to, to change the space. Uh, to change things, to, to change your perception of it and uh, how you feel about it. Uh, yes, uh, let's, are you going to return to painting on a flat surface? And uh, just to follow up, do uh, you uh, see painting on a flat surface as a dead end? Well, I have some of those paintings I showed were paintings on flat surfaces. And I think they were pretty good, but they have a problem that they're not so good unless they have a lot of shadow, a lot of illusionism. And the trompe l'oeil is sort of against my religion. Uh, so it's a, it's a real conflict. So I, uh, you know, it was a way of doing it and getting the idea and seeing what it does, but I don't think that I would be happy with it. Can you just talk about the way the forms mingle or create something else as ambiguity? Uh, well, I like to think that they're, I mean, you, you can't, you can't nail everything down, but I mean, I'm not seeking ambiguity for its own sake. There's sometimes uh, things seem ambiguous and sometimes that's a, that's a plus, but it's not, it's not a goal. Uh, and neither really is complexity. 
but ambiguity and complexity, and I don't think I was with that, you know, are, are pretty necessary ingredients. Uh, so you, you know, the question is, you know, to, 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 to deal with them and uh, have them, you know, that's the job, that's where the art part comes in. You have to pull it together. Let's take one or two more. Okay, sorry. You've been using a computer a lot in, in transformations. And the computer gives you an opportunity to generate continual movement. Not the ones that I can afford. <laughs> <laughs> but the, you could spend a sabbatical at MIT for a while, and there are plenty of computers that seem to keep moving all the time. Um, have you thought of, of actually constructing the artwork on a computer, or do you consider it only a tool for the use in, in, in constructing static work? Yeah, I, I see it only as a tool, and I only really like one thing about it, uh, which is the most simple and obvious thing, the ability to rotate the thing in space and to really sort of move it around. The stretching and uh, pulling and all the complicated things you can do with it, I can do that with the model anyway, and I can even turn the model, but it's nice to be able to see it. it it's, it's a very useful tool. Uh, I was very unhappy uh, with my experience. The, the reason we started using a computer in the first place was to help us build things, and that was a complete disaster. It's worthless as a tool for building anything, so uh, at least on the level that you can afford. So I don't know. I mean, uh, you can, you can build anything you want using a computer. If you build it, make one thing, it costs a fortune. If you do that 10,000 or 150,000 times, it's a perfectly useful tool. But for doing it once and changing it immediately and doing something different, it's a, uh, it's a nightmare. Um, but also, as, as I've talked about with some other people, the, the issue, I mean, the thing that I'm interested in, I suppose, is what uh, a lot of other people are interested in. The smoke, certainly, I'd like to... Uh, put on the computer and then see how it would change under you know conditions of heat, uh, wind, uh, humidity, and whatnot. But uh, since if you know a way to do it, you can let me know. Uh, since it's all particles, uh, it's kind of expensive to map them or whatever you do on the computer, put them out. We'll just take two more. Okay. Your work, your most recent work, seems to be on the verge of movement. Uh, what is your feeling about kinetic art as it was done a long time ago and is yeah. still being done by others? No, I don't have anything against kinetic art. I mean, uh, uh, but, you know, one of the problems with it is that it, uh, it, it's the problem of literalism. It is what it is and it does what it does. And uh, it tends to lack uh, a kind of uh, magic it, uh, that you know that seems to be inherent in illusionism. But I don't, I don't have anything against it. In fact, I own some. But uh, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's possible. I mean, there are a lot of things you could do. But uh, one of the problems with, you know, from a practical point of view, movement's a difficult problem because. Uh, you know, it's, an, it's, it's a question of how much you want to program and how much you want to control and then what you want it to do. But look, it's possible. I don't, I, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to happen. There's going to be more of it. And maybe it'll be better. Let's take a last question. Uh, I've been seeking, one of the main things is that I've been seeking movement and the other thing is that are very interested in surfaces. But the thing is that if you paint on fixed surfaces, those are not going to move at all. Uh, what about move, uh, but on the other hand, you have the practical problems of, I do say, for instance, the, the artwork of mud with bubbles, but there are compromises, like for instance, painting on flexible surfaces, such as shades. Yeah, look, we tried to build a building with Teflon and they got hysterical. I mean, <laughs> so, uh, but I mean, lots of other people are doing it. Look, I, I think it, it, it's, it's perfectly possible. Yeah, I mean, I love. I mean, I wanted to use mirrored mylar, too. I mean, th there are a lot of materials out there. There are a lot of things that you can do. But then the question becomes, you know, how do you program or control the movement? What's, what's the movement going to be? Is it going to flutter in the breeze or not? I mean, uh, you know, what's, what's the move? OK, look, maybe there's a confusion. Not, not a confusion. I mean, it's my own fault, but it's OK. Movement is one thing, OK? And so it's literal movement. It does this or it does that. But the heart of the matter is not as much the movement as it is the action, OK? It's what's depicted. It's what's happening. 
And it's what makes painting great, whether it's abstract or real, is how, is how you perceive that, how you relate to that, to, to the action, to the movement, to the kind of movement that it is, how it's informed, what it's doing. It's not just the movement. I mean, the movement is a way of describing it, but it's really basically the action, which is the action, the subject, or whatever it is. Well, let me, um, there's no way to summarize all of this that we've just gone through, but let, 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 let me ask let, one. Let me try, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm not, even for an academic, I'm not so foolish as to try that. Um, but, but, but what I would like to do is ask you one, one, one final broad question, say, where, 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 where do you go from here? What do you see as the most exciting things to explore? And, and uh, what, 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 what are the ideas that really animate you right now for your new work? Well, the hardest thing and the most interesting thing to me is to keep going on all, uh, as I described before, which was the point of the diagrams and everything, which was to, uh, you know, deal with fine art as an enterprise and to be able to work, uh, you know, but it's hard to be able to or to afford it, whatever you want to say, uh, and also in terms of energy as well as all the other things, uh, to see with, uh, to, to keep working on uh, basically the three areas more or less at the same time, I mean, and to see where it, it gets me. I don't, I don't, um, I guess what I want to say is I don't want to drop any one of the three in particular. Uh, and it doesn't matter to me about architecture if I don't, you know, if I have to see Philip's version of it. But I mean, I don't, I don't it's, uh, uh, you know, just to keep working on the ideas, on the models and the projects and to keep thinking about it, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Mm -hmm. <laughs>